So we have one more general topic to cover before we dive into some of the specifics of what we're going to be studying in Chapter 3. And so one of the last topics from Chapter 2 is, in general, where do impairments come from for a digital communications uh, signal? And in particular, there'll be one source of uh, imperfection, some impairment, which we're going to see over and over again because it's such a key factor in the quality of a communications uh, system, and that is intersymbol interference. But let's just start with the laundry list. What are the different uh, sources of signal impairments that we could have in a digital system? We talked about quantification noise. We looked at uh, quantification saturation when we don't have enough levels. These two things clearly are going to impact um, the uh, quality distortion of the reconstructed signal at the, trans at the receiver. There are also very practical problems like timing errors. We're talking about a bit interval, a symbol interval, or clock recovery. Um, we're going to be uh, sampling um, our signal. All of these mean that timing errors could re uh, lead to um, some errors, impairments in the signal. Channel noise is going to be the big uh, contributor that we're going to focus on in this course. And in a, any digital communications course, these are the ones we're, we're going to uh, look at. So the different kinds of channel noise would be uh, first thermal noise. And this is electronic noise in your receiver, which is completely unavoidable. Any, every electronics uh, introduces thermal noise into the detection process. If we have a uh, channel which is uh, shared by multiple users, let's think of the cellular mobile channel, uh, Wi-Fi channel, there are many people accessing at the same time, then you could actually get interference from just more people uh, trying to use the, the channel, and that acts as a noise. And uh, one of the uh, big ones is the intersymbol interference, which I will be talking to you about today in more detail. So just to say that in this class, what we focus on is thermal noise, and we saw that in the additive white Gaussian noise discussion in the random processes, and now I'm going to be talking to you more about intersymbol interference, and it's going to, uh, I think, uh, bring together these concepts where I've mentioned spectral efficiency as being one of the criteria for what is a good communications channel. I've talked about PCN and PAM. Uh, one of the fundamental differences being the bandwidth occupied that goes for different line codes as, as well. And now when I do the, give you this discussion, very preliminary discussion early in the course on intersymbol interference, I'd just like to motivate why these criteria are so important uh, because it is a significant source of signal impairment if we don't uh, address the issue. So what is intersymbol interference? Well, I, I talked to you earlier about uh, free uh, analysis and what that means in terms of uh, a linear time invariant system, in terms of filtering, in terms of definitions of bandwidth. So we have this concept that a channel is always limited in bandwidth. When I use a twisted pair, um, there's certain attenuation above a given frequency. Therefore, we say that the, the bandwidth is fairly limited of optical fiber, the attenuation is much lower over a tremendously large bandwidth. But it still is limited. It's not infinite. And today in commercial systems, we're seeing the limit of the bandwidth of the optical fiber, for instance. So the channel is always bandwidth limited. And the signal, of course, is always limited in time. I'm doing a transmission during a certain uh, time interval. In theory, that means it's never limited in uh, bandwidth, that it has infinite bandwidth. So I'm trying to send a signal which has infinite bandwidth through a channel which has limited bandwidth. So the result is that I'm always going to have some distortion introduced to my signal when it passes through a channel. Of course, everything's relative. If the signal uh, is very attenuated, if the channel is much wider, well, then, of course, this uh, effect I'm discussing won't be um, uh, visible. However, uh, in theory, passing a time-limited signal through a bandwidth-limited channel will always lead to the effect of pulse spreading. So the fact that I am truncating part of my um, bandwidth of my, inf uh, my limited uh, time signal means that the signal in the time domain is going to end up being dispersed 
to some extent because of the fact that there is not enough available bandwidth to support the signal. So pulse spreading is the phenomena that leads to intersymbol interference. So pulse spreading, which comes from uh, trying to pass a signal through bandwidth, uh, which is not adequate for it, will lead to pulse spreading. And so I did some very simple simulations in MATLAB to try and give you a feel for um, what is the relative importance of the signal bandwidth and the channel bandwidth. So let's start with the uh, signal bandwidth. So I put this symbol here, bandwidth of the signal, and I have here in the uh, frequency domain a little plot of what the uh, signal bandwidth looks like. Uh, so this is frequency domain. You can see this is a sync function, which means I'm using a square wave in the uh, time domain. And if we look over here in the uh, other plot I have here is a time domain uh, picture of my signal. And in red, what we have is what's happening at the transmitter. So I have a certain, I think this is a time interval one normalized that, that shows one bit interval and everything's perfect square wave. And if I looked at the uh, frequency domain, then this is uh, what I would get, a sync function. And I'm going to define for the purposes of this example that the bandwidth of the signal is the main lobe, uh, zero, first zero to first zero, the main lobe bandwidth for the signal. So, okay, I, it has a certain bandwidth. What happens if I pass it through a channel. And the channel in this case I'm going to assume is just you know, like an ideal low pass filter. And it's uh, this uh, bandwidth of the channel I'm going to assume now in my first simulation is 10 times as wide as the, the um, bandwidth of the signal. So I have a very, very, very wide channel. I'm trying to send through, you know, telegraph signal, a very uh, slow signal through an optical fiber. You know, this is lots of bandwidth. In that case, if I see in blue, and it's kind of hard to see, but I look at what happens to this perfect rectangular pulse once it goes through that, that channel, um, low-pass filter, and very little happens to it. The blue is pretty much on top of the red. Uh, there's a little bit of ripple, really, really small. You'd have to zoom in to see. But the channel is much wider than the signal, so I really don't have any, any problem. Uh, here I just illustrated for you 10 times. So this is the uh, low-pass filter I used for the uh, channel. Uh, here I um, wanted to show you after filtering. It's a bit uh, bigger and it's a little easier for you to see now. Uh, I, I enhanced it. But there is a little ringing. It's not perfect, but very, very little effect. But now let's suppose that I'm looking at a channel which is on a par on the bandwidth of the signal. So the bandwidth of the channel, this low pass filter, lets through the entire main lobe of the signal, but it is cutting off all of these side lobes to the signal. So it's going to distort the signal because I'm losing the side lobes. So now I look, and now after um, uh, filtering, we can see you know, a more uh, distortion uh, being introduced um, by this filtering effect but still not, not too, too bad. I said, that, uh, I said that the source of intersymbol interference is going to be the spreading. And by the spreading, I mean that here in the red, we see that the pulse is absolutely over. It's only zero, it's only non-zero in time inside of the time of a bit. But now the filtered signal, we can see that some of the energy of the signal is leaking to outside of the actual bit interval. And so that's why we call it spreading. But there's some of the pulse is available over a wider time frame than one was originally transmitted. So now suppose that I'm looking at something like one half of the signal bandwidth. So now I'm really uh, cutting off uh, quite a significant amount of the signal. And uh, this is distorting the signal. And now we can see really major uh, overflow of the signal outside of the uh, bit interval. So we can see here that instead of being isolated to a rectangular pulse within one bit interval, so that it's only non-zero during the time of uh, the bit transmission, I have significant energy outside of that bit interval now.
Okay, so this is the pulse spreading that comes from passing your signal through a band limited channel. If I make it even more exaggerated, if I try to really uh, send very fast uh, transmissions through a channel which really is not adapted for it, well then I can get something really ridiculous for a pulse spreading. So if I were sending just one bit, maybe this would not be such a big deal. But of course what I'm sending is a bit sequence. So here's a little illustration uh, that shows what is intersymbol interference in uh, the result of this pulse spreading. So if I sent just one, and let's suppose that uh, during uh, logical zero I send nothing, something we call unoff keying. So logical one, I send a voltage. Logical zero, I send nothing. Well, as long as I have a one and then no, all logical zeros afterwards, well, uh, there's at least no overlapping. However, what's going to happen is that my pulse is not zero outside during the next symbol interval. Now, suppose it's time for me to detect the second bit, and I'm expecting if there's any voltage, that that means it's a 1. So I could make a mistake in my um, reception because I'm seeing some non-zero uh, voltage here. Uh, and so it's uh, not surprising that this pulse spreading would lead to errors in the uh, detected uh, symbol. And this, of course, applies whether I'm using, um, uh, if I have a number of bits, uh, for, for instance, a pattern 1011, uh, it's possible that this uh, intersymbol interference could be even more severe. So depending on the pattern, the interference that I experience in one bit could be different from the interference I experience in another bit. And we call this a pattern-dependent uh, noise. So depending on the particular pattern of bits, there will be some sort of unlucky patterns of bits, and maybe some more fortunate patterns of bits where the interference actually enhances the detection. But, uh, you know, on average, this is something that's very bad that happens. So uh, the conclusion I'd like to uh, draw is that this uh, intersymbol interference can have uh, you know, a very detrimental effect. Uh, here's another illustration. Uh, here is S0. Um, and we can see that the signal reflections are lasting a long time so that when it's time for me to do detection of the red, I've still got some blue in it, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's really just the same, uh, another uh, illustration. What's interesting about intersymbol interference is that it's interference that's coming from my own transmission. It's like I'm shooting myself in the foot. It's not. Uh, thermal noise, it's not a different user who's causing this uh, problem, it's really my transmission itself. Which means that one of the solutions is not going to be to just send more power. Because if I say uh, additive white Gaussian noise is my problem, I can make my signal stronger, sending a stronger, higher amplitude signal, and that means the noise will have less effect. But if I try that same strategy here with intersymbol interference, well, it's not going to help me at all because if I make everything bigger, well, my neighboring uh, bits are just as big and it's going to just cause the same amount of intersymbol interference. So it's a, an impairment that cannot be corrected by throwing more energy at the problem. So we'll be hearing a lot more about ISI um, as we go through the course. And uh, what I would like you to do to remember is that uh, when we develop uh, equations, expressions for the uh, performance of a digital communication systems, we're assuming that we have done everything in our power to avoid this intersymbol interference effect. And that the equations that we come up with are all saying, well, if I don't have intersymbol interference, then the kind of performance I can achieve is, and we'll be quantifying that in, in various different forms. Okay.